And now at Christmas, looking for some crack candy. But he, God, is always able. Today, we, we continue in this series, The Power of Your Season. We started really in September talking about the power of our thoughts and the power of the word, our words. And, and then we began October uh, looking at the power of singleness. And many of us were a little surprised that we talked about singleness being a gift. Uh, but today I want to embark for this Sunday and next. Sister Parker and I are supposed to share with you next Sunday on this, the power of your season of marriage. Uh, I know, boy. I pray hard. All right, let's do this before I read my text. Let's do this. Uh, oh, no. Elder Robinson married Sister Darlene Freeman yesterday. <laughs> so we have Elder and Sister Robinson. Amen. Congratulations. Congratulations. I just happened to look over there and I said, oh, yeah, there they are. They got married yesterday and had a great time and I thank God for them. And as even they are a model and picture of what God designed for marriage. How many of you are married right now? If you are married right now, I need to see your hand. All right. Then. How many of you, keep your hand up. How, now see, how many of you have ever been married, but you're not married. Not, it might have been widowhood, divorce, what have you. I need everybody who, if you're already married, if you've been married before, um, whether, and you're no longer married, either by widow or divorce, what have you, okay? Wow. Wow, you can put your hands down. Amen. 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 Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. <laughs> Let me just get right to it. <laughs> Holy Spirit, breathe on me. <laughs> Isn't that what the, I think the children saying that? Ephesians 5. When you find it, would you stand with me? It's a well familiar passage of scripture. Generally, when I preach on marriage, which I have not done in a, specifically, in several years, um, this is one of the main passages. I believe I know so because it speaks to the heart of God's picture and design for marriage. When you find it, Ephesians 5, would you say amen? Then let's look at verse 21. And we're going to read to the end of the chapter. If you don't have it yet, say, wait a minute. All right. I got one honest person. When you find it, they'll say amen. All right. Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 21. I want to read to the end of the chapter. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. And now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Uh, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father 
and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Lord, speak to your people through your word. This is your word, not mine. I pray your spirit now will guide, our, uh, guide the words that through my mouth to the hearts and minds of your people. Because, Lord, we want to leave here differently than we came. We've praised, we've prayed, we have sung, we have lifted our hands, we have cried out hallelujah, we have shouted amen. Hope you, we pray that you've been pleased with us, but now, Lord, you got to speak. And I pray that there be no hindrance of your spirit from your throne through your servant to your people. In Christ's name, I pray and ask it all. Amen. You may be seated. How of your season, marriage. I want to talk about marriage is a mystery. Marriage is a mystery. I'll get into that in a moment. You know what? When we marry, those of us who have, are married and have been married, we do so because we are in love. Or at minimum, we think we're in love. We see in another person a partner who will bring happiness and fulfillment and joy. When we caught it, our hearts uh, were drawn to them somehow, initially, maybe physically. But then as we got to know them, the physical attraction led to this idea that, that um, we wanted to live with them forever. You say forever, Pastor? Really? Yeah. Because nobody goes into marriage thinking divorce. Nobody. So we think we, we think we are and we pray and we want that. For many, marriage provides the person whom God, whom we believe God has designed for us. That person who completes us. That, that person who makes us feel good about ourselves. This person always says the magic words, I love you. And you know what? Amazingly, we believe them. Why do we believe them? Why do we believe them? Because they really believe it. And you do too. It is sincere. Why do we believe them? Why? Because this is the way we were created. We were created to love and to be loved. And marriage can help us fulfill this need, this God-created need that he, he has given us to love. And so marriage is the goal to which the vast majority of us aspire. Some because we want to express our sexuality. Some because others because we have this image in our mind and the list can go on. But for most people, they desire marriage. Even after widow, even after divorce, single, we desire marriage. But in this process of seeking love and to be loved, generally we marry somebody who's not like us. Nobody marries themselves. This other, this other person, this other person does for us what we can't do for ourselves. We can't love ourselves. Love requires an other. Someone to say, to acknowledge, to lift and say, I love you. You're important. You are significant. This other person that we say completes us, complements us, develops another side of us. 
that we might not even be aware of. See, this is what makes them fun. Because they think differently, because they may look different, they, they may see life differently, and we didn't see that as fun, but when we got with them, it sure became fun. They are fun. Why? Interesting, because they are different. But then the full picture sets in after you get married. The reality sets in. You get the full picture. Why? Because immediately as you stand before me as a pastor or a judge or uh, anyone else who presides over a marriage, as soon as each says, I do, and that, that person says, I now pronounce you man and wife as I did yesterday, something immediately changes. Immediately, God says a miracle takes place where one man and one woman who came in two separate doors now are one. And so the person that you fell in love with is different at the very point at which you say, I do. And then you get to wondering, well, who did I marry? <laughs> you know what? You changed them. You changed them. It's you. See, I got to watch this side over here. <laughs> I hear you, bro Smith. <laughs> if singleness is a gift, and that was revolutionary for some of us a couple of weeks ago, then marriage is a mystery. Be careful, though, when I say mystery. I'm talking about in the biblical sense. I'm not talking about in our mystery novel kind of way. I'm not talking about something that's strange or something that's a secret or something that's puzzling. No, when the scripture speaks about mystery, he's talking, the scripture is talking about a divine information or divine some secret that is revealed to a special group of people. A mystery is simply something that is unknown, that is directly revealed by God. So take out our English definition of mystery. Put in the biblical definition of mystery. In this passage that we've read, Paul is not saying that marriage is the mystery. But the relationship between Christ and the church, which the marriage pictures, is the mystery. Marriage is not a mystery. That woman, that man you married, they're not mysterious. You knew who you were marrying. You looked her straight in the eye. And all the stuff you didn't like, you were so in love, you just ignored it. So don't come up here now. Because every person that I have ever counseled, from my personal friends to members, everyone who actually talked about, they will tell me, Pastor, I saw that before we got married. You just thought your love was going to allow you to ignore it or overcome it or my sisters change it. I'm going to change that, brother. I'm going to put something on him. He going to. Oh, I'm sorry. That was not written here. Sister Parker, you need to pray that I don't go off script. Paul is not saying that marriage is a mystery. What it pictures is the mystery. The oneness between Christ and the church. 
Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. The divine human relationship, this one flesh, is the divine secret of which marriage is the picture. Marriage is the human symbol, the picture that clarifies for us the divine human relationship. In both the Old and the New Testaments, the marriage relationship is used as a picture to help us understand our relationship to God. Because we are not God. We are not eternal, all-knowing, and infinite being like he is. God uses human pictures, analogies, symbols to help us understand him and our relationship with him and how he operates with us. That is why when we hear the Lord is my shepherd, that's a picture of a relationship that we have with him. He is our shepherd. We are sheep. When we say God is our father, that is a picture. God is just not a father, but he demonstrates to us fatherhood characteristics that we can understand there, understand. And so when scripture refers to God being a husband and Jesus being a bridegroom, he is revealing another aspect of his character and who he is and how he operates with us. Listen to the word. Hosea chapter 2. And in that day declares the Lord, I will call, you will call me my husband. And no longer will you call me my Baal. And I will betroth you to me forever. He's talking about the nation of Israel. About himself. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and steadfast love and mercy. Listen to Isaiah 62. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God rejoices over you. He uses the image of a, man, a young man and a young woman getting married and he rejoices over his young wife, so God rejoices over us. We can understand who he is. He gives us marriage. Listen to Jesus. And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast. He's talking about himself. So what? If, if marriage is not this mystery, then why entitle my sermon? Marriage is a mystery. Well, in order to understand this singleness as a divine gift, which for many of us was a revelation, you need a divine perspective to understand marriage. We need that. To experience the power of marriage, which is the focus of this whole thing, this power of your season. And if your season is marriage right now, to experience the power of your season of marriage one must take divine eyes to see God's purpose, his great and his greatest creation, and God use of the marriage as, as God's use of his marriage relationship to produce his purpose. Let me read that again. To experience the power of marriage in your life, one must take on divine eyes to see God's purpose for us. His greatest creation, that's us. And God's use of marriage to produce this purpose in us. You see, brothers and sisters, if you're married, then God's power is seen, made real, exposed in the context of your marriage. Let me say something that may be difficult for us to hear. You know, that's not unusual for me. For you to hear, to take in and to accept. To walk away from marriage gets difficult. To walk away when marriage gets difficult is to walk away from the operation of God in your life. To walk away from marriage 
is to walk away from the relationship that God has placed in your life that he might make you look like him. You're walking away from the power of God operating. Mm, yeah, wow. What's God's purpose for your lives then? What does it mean? God's purpose for your life and mine is really simple. It's to live with him in eternity. God wants to be with us. That's it. That's his purpose. That's why he made us. He wants us to be in relationship with him. It is that simple. Jesus came, he says, to be with us. His name, Emmanuel, God with us. God's purpose for our lives is that we might be in relationship with him, that we might be loved by him, and that we might love him back. That's our sole purpose. He simply wants to be with us, fellowship with us, love us. He wants us, like any parent, like any creator, to be like him, to experience all that life created for us to experience. He wants to ex us to experience everything that he created this world for. He created it for our enjoyment. He created the, uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars that we might enjoy. He made the rivers and the mountains. He put up the, he made the seas so that we might swim in them and sail in them. He made the oceans. He made the mountains so that we might look at their high peaks and rejoice. He made the birds so that we might hear them sing. He did that that we might enjoy him. And in the garden, he created us for fellowship with him. This world was created that we might live like him, to be co-creators and do as he did, to be fruitful and multiply, to take dominion in everything. Genesis 1.27 says, so God created man in his image, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them in his image. So if we're in the image of God, then we are to take dominion. If we're in the image of God, then we are to take, be fruitful and multiply. If we are to be in the image of God, we are to be creators because he is the ultimate creator. And into this, but into this garden situation, into this perfect creation step sin. And when God made us in his own image with the power to choose him and the power not to choose him, we were made like him in his image. He gave us the choice to either choose him or not choose him. That makes us in his image. God chooses and he chose us. As image bearers, Adam and Eve chose wrong. They chose not to choose him. They chose the latter. And since that time, we have been in broken relationship with God. And because our relationship with God is broken, every other relationship is broken. All relationships, starting with our relationship with God, is broken. Singles and married, employer, employee, parent, child, they're broken outside of God. As a matter of fact, it's because our relationship with God is, was broken in the garden that all other relationships are, are the same. Now I want you to please note this. Marriage came before sin. Let me repeat that. Because some of y'all swear. I was all right till I got married. No, you weren't. Without Christ, you were just as broken, sinful. That, that husband ain't brought the worst out of you. It was already in you. That wife didn't bring, didn't teach you how to cuss. You learned how to cuss before she got you. And you got hurt. Mm-hmm, y'all got that piece. Marriage is not the problem. Sin is the problem. Marriage is not the problem. Sin is. So in order to fulfill our divine purpose of just being with him, to be with God, we need our sin problem to be handled, to be fixed, to be taken care of. 
Jesus Christ came to die in our place as a substitute to pay the penalty for our sin. I'm going somewhere, y'all. Y'all have heard this before, but y'all need to, this is the foundation. Jesus' sacrifice makes us holy again. Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary's cross broke the penalty of sin for us, and now we can enter into a relationship, into fellowship with God himself, and that was God's ultimate purpose and created us, that we might be in fellowship with him. Sin broke that fellowship. Jesus Christ came back to make a bridge between us and God again so that we could be in perfect relationship with him. So that's what's marriage. So then what does marriage have to do with all of this, Pastor? Simply, this is for those who are married. Our spouse is the main tool that God uses to make us look like Jesus. Our spouse is the number one tool that God uses to make you and me look like Jesus. See, that's why when it get tough, you blame the spouse. If she was different, if he was different, if he do this, I would do that. But since he ain't doing that, I ain't. That really does sound like Jesus. Obviously, I'm being sarcastic. So you know, sometimes I got to be. If she would do better, that would just motivate me to be a better man. Mm-hmm. You dreaming. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, we are made to be little Christ. The more we look like Jesus, the more we're able to fellowship with God. The more we act like him, the more we can fellowship with God. Jesus was the perfect example of fellowshipping with his father. He demonstrated what a right relationship looks like. He demonstrated, he showed us the power that comes with being in relationship with God. He shows us what we can do. Jesus said, you know, it's the theme verse for my ministry here as your pastor. Even greater things. That's the promise. That he would call us to do even greater things. Specifically in the context of that verse in John is simply this, that we would see more people come to, come to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ than Jesus ever encountered. And so, brothers and sisters, marriage is more than a relationship that offers the answer to our loneliness. Marriage is more than an opportunity to have sex. Marriage is more than an opportunity for us to find happiness in, some, in a relationship with someone else. It is all of that, but it's more. Many, and many married folk, if they really are honest, will tell you there are seasons in marriage when none of that happens. They'll tell you, you're, you can be lonely in marriage. You can, the Lord might not give you children. There are many seasons where you're not happy. And if somebody tells you that's, that, if some married person tells you that that ain't true, they lie. Because there are seasons when it ain't pretty. And you don't feel good. And he don't make you feel and she don't make you feel the way you want to feel. But watch this. That's not the purpose of marriage. I know I'm talking countercultural here. I know I'm cutting across the grain right here. I know, I know it doesn't sound good, feel good. But the truth is that God is concerned more about our holiness than he is about our happiness. And 
And especially to my young people, I'm concerned because we go into marriage hoping that this person will do and be for us. And you know what? That's not her job. That's not his job. When we talked about singleness a few years ago, you are a man regardless of whether you have a woman or not. Then what does marriage offer then, Pastor? You going, man, you, let me get to it then. Really? I've been married all these years. I, or some of my young folks saying, well, maybe I ought not get married, you know. And you know, right? Some of y'all might not, that might not be what God's calling for. That's not my, I'm talking, since I spent three weeks talking about two singles, I want you to hear. And the married folk had to listen. I'm asking my single folk to listen. What does marriage have to offer? What's its real purpose? To make you holy. It offers one, a relationship that makes us holy, which makes it so that we can be with God. The only, those who are not holy can't be with Jesus, can't be with God. God, in order to dwell with him, in order to fellowship with him, in order to be in his presence, we have to be holy. That's why the blood of Jesus has to cleanse us before we can enter into the presence of God. And so the marriage relationship is designed by God to get you holy so you can get into the presence of God. Wow. You mean she all of that? You mean he all of that? Yes. In 1646, the Westminster Confession of Faith said this, that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. If you really, I'm talking about if you're in marriage now, if you really want to enjoy God forever, then you know what? That spouse that you have is designed to help you to enjoy God. And when you enjoy God, you'll enjoy your spouse. Man. Marriage offers us the opportunity to enjoy God and thereby enjoying God, another human being, and not just that one person that you're married to. This is why the text says submit. See, in verse 22, the word submit is not in the original language. It's absent. It has been supplied by the English. The word submit is in, chapter, is in verse 21. Submitting one to the other. I know that's a cuss word, and if it was a four-letter word, it would qualify. But that word submit is biblical, it's true, and that's I ain't, I ain't cutting it out because it don't feel good. Husbands are to submit to their wives. How? By loving them as Christ loves the church. And wives are to submit to their husbands. Why? Because, because, because he is the head as Christ is the head of the church. I got four amens and two head nods. <laughs> Sisters, let me tell you, there's a whole lot more verses in here about what the man's supposed to do than what the brother's supposed to do. Brother's supposed to die for y'all. It says to love her as Christ loves the church. What did Christ do for the church? He died. Brothers say died. And that's the old preacher would say, didn't he die? And that's right, Herman. Didn't he do it? Now, sisters, I don't know no man or woman that's looking to die. That is not by nature. If God did infuse that man with his Holy Spirit, as my children, my babies say, Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Ain't no man going to die for you. He ain't looking to die. You're supposed to be bringing him life. And you bringing him death. And he's supposed to be excited. And sisters, 
Unless the Holy Spirit brings on you, I don't know one woman that by nature wants to submit. It is a punishment. Because your ancestor Eve got out of line. And the brother was, wasn't, the brother said, yes ma'am. If the brother had said, no, or let, at least, if he didn't tell you no, because y'all can't stand to have the word no to y'all. If he had just said, baby, come on over here. Let's talk to God and see what he got to say about what you heard. And so in Genesis chapter 3, and therefore you will submit to your husband. That's where the conflict in marriage comes. It's because of our sin. It's not marriage. There's nothing wrong with marriage. Marriage is a great thing. It's an awesome thing. It's not for everybody. Everybody's not called to it. And let me say this. You can be holy outside of marriage. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not holy, single for, but we went through that. That you're less than. Because you know what? A thousand years ago, everybody said that married people were second class citizens. It just shifted here in the last two, three hundred years. But if you really wanted to be holy after the death of Jesus, they said you ought to be single. That's why you have in the Catholic Church single priests and nuns. That's why you have monks that went out into the desert and stayed there. And we learned much from them. And, but they, that Aristotle, them fellas, that... Augustine got this idea going that marriage some, was somehow secondary. It was better to be single. And we walked through all of that stuff, but how Paul said that and why he said that. But now it's shifted. It's now that marriage is the highest thing. And that's the thing that everybody's supposed to be. And you know what? Marriage ain't for everybody. So I don't want to lift up marriage as higher than singleness and or vice versa. Everybody's single, there won't be no babies. Well, I ain't gonna, no, I gotta qualify that. <laughs> they ain't supposed to be none. Yeah, let me back up a little bit. Got a little ahead of myself. <laughs> what about marriage shapes us to be like God? What is it about marriage? So that we can enjoy God forever. You know what? What does the shaping and makes us holy is the fact that that person is other. It's other than you. She's other than you. That means she's different. He's different than you. He's other. The otherness of the other person. Whether a spouse or another person we're close to, the fact that they are not like us and they see the world different than us and demonstrate another aspect of the glory of God. Each of us as God's creation reflects in some way the, create, the image of God. We are in his image. So you married folk, when you turn over to your spouse, if they're here right now, say, you know what? You are in God's image. Sister Parker, you are in God's image. I, you know I ain't no turn to your neighbor preacher, so do it right now. I don't say it, but twice a year. Look over to your spouse right now and tell them, you are in God's image. Mm -hmm. I ain't getting much cooperation. Y'all done left a spouse at home. <laughs> hey, that's, hey, when you figure out that the one you, that means don't mess with. Brothers, don't mess with. Sisters, don't mess with. God's image. So when we enter into marriage, the otherness of the other person offers us the opportunity for tremendous companionship. It offers the opportunity for friendship. 
It offers us opportunity for joy and fulfillment. Because, but it's because the person is other. It is because the person doesn't think like you. Because it's because they see differently. I had to laugh at my children. My younger, my children, I had to laugh at them. One of my children can look up in the clouds and say, that's a cumulus, that's a cirrus, that's a, I forgot the other names of the clouds. I got another child to look up in the clouds and say, Daddy, you see that elephant up there? Elephant? They're two different people. They see life differently. But when we get in marriage, this other person that we fell in love with, this otherness of that person that attracted us begins to repel us. And so that's where all the conflict comes in and the resentment and the disappointment and a whole lot of pain in the process of becoming holy because you do need somebody other than you to make you holy. Because otherwise you think you holy all by yourself. I'm good. Matter of fact, I tell this part once why, hey, I was pretty good before I got up with you. I knew something. Mm-hmm and uh-huh. She ain't said that, but that sure didn't feel like what it felt like. Yeah, right. Y'all didn't hear. I don't know who. Would the judge row say that? Oh, that's Sister Hooker. That was the person behind the judge row. See, Sister Hooker, you were laughing too hard. You gave yourself away. Let me carry on. Marriage also offers us... It offers another human relationship what no other human relationship can do. Marriage offers what no other human relationship can do. A binding covenant. You see, when you walk away from any other relationship, your friend, if you walk away from a friendship or your boss or your job, even if you walk away from parenting, it is not the same experience as in which God describes as a tearing of the flesh. See, when you walk away from marriage, you rip apart the oneness that God created when you were married in the first place. I knew I was going to get quiet on me. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one. That's why divorce is so painful. That's why it's so heartrending. That's why it takes years to get over it, because there is a ripping of flesh. It is only in the marriage of relation. The power of the marriage relationship is found in the commitment not to walk away. What makes the oneness in marriage a picture of Christ and the church is the fact that God never walks away. God, Jesus never walks away from his bride. The marriage pictures or represents an everlasting desire that God has to be with us. Does God discipline? Yes, he does. Does God rebuke? Yes, he does. But God never walks away. God never leaves you or forsake you. And so it is the marriage relationship that pictures this. This is why it's a mystery. This is why it's an eternal, it is a commitment. And that is what gives it the power. If I don't like her, I ain't going nowhere. She don't like me, she ain't going nowhere. We're going to have to figure it out. And you know what? Because I got to figure it out. In order for me to stay with her and she with me, you know what marriage teaches me? It teaches me how to forgive. It teaches me how to overlook. It teaches me to engage when I don't feel like it. It teaches me to become something that I am not by myself. I need somebody to say to me, not only do I love you, but you know what? You're wrong. I'm going to finish this. 
You want me to hurry up? Okay. Uh All right. I'm on my 35th minute. I'm counting. Let me hurry on then. Marriage offers us the opportunity to see God in a multitude of ways. When we marry, we don't marry ourselves. We marry another person who themselves are in the image of God. When we look at our spouse, we see God's creation. We talked about that earlier. That is why we're not to mess with them. And so, you know what? And finally, when we marry someone other than us, we see God in new and profound ways. He's not, in other words, because we're in God's image, each spouse in the relationship, God is not limited to doing things your way. And so we get to see God manifested in in multiple ways in the context of marriage. So he gives us spouses that see and do see things differently than us and does things differently than us. And he gets the glory out of both. God can get the glory out of her being an introvert and him being an extrovert. And God can get the glory out of her being a homemaker and being a, uh, 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 being in the workplace. He, either one. He can get the glory out of him being a carpenter or a doctor or a judge or a trash collector. God can get the glory out of her handling a situation in this way. And he can also get the glory out of him handling this situation that way. The two don't, are not mutually exclusive. They can exist together. God is not limit, in, limited in how he operates with us. And so you only get that in marriage. But we want sameness. We want uniformity. We want that person to think like us, do it the way we want it done. We want him to speak when he, like he's supposed to speak. He's, she's supposed to do what I'm suppo- I want her to do. And you know what? We want that sameness. We want that uniformity. But God gives us diversity. And he wants unity in the diversity. That is how we reflect the glory of God. I ain't got but four more lines. Everybody look at the window, this stained glass window. You know what makes them beautiful? The different colors. The different colors. Gary Thomas wrote this book in 2000, Sacred Marriage. What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? He writes this, marriage teaches us how to love, teaches us how to respect others, how to pray. If you, I don't know how you stay married and don't know how to pray. Learn how to pray. That's right, Sister Smith, that brother Smith I heard earlier, sister, you're going to pray. Going to teach, teaches you how to forgive. But watch this, you want to be in relationship with God, then you're going to have to forgive. You have to learn how to forgive. Because he's not going to forgive you unless you do what? God Almighty. Marriage is like nothing else. Watch this. There's no other relationship that can get you to understand your innate selfishness than marriage. Ain't nothing going to teach you you are a sinner more than marriage will. That's right. Help me, Lord Jesus. That's what Reverend Smith said. Help me, Lord Jesus. And you know why? And you know why we give up on marriage? Because we don't want anything or anybody reminding us that we are selfish and we're sinful. And so I'd rather be away from that. Don't tell me I'm not. And they don't have to speak the word. The spouse doesn't have to speak the word. You just, if you take a look at you long enough and in your interactions with your spouse, you will recognize unless you're in denial and you got a six o'clock class <laughs> that you are sinful, selfish. You think about self first, but in marriage, can't do that. 
Marriage offers sexual fulfillment. It's holy, fulfilling, a magnificent. Sexual sex is a, is a physical expression of the passions of God himself. He gave it to us. It's a physical expression of the very passion of God. And the product, in some cases, of a sexual relationship is his greatest creation, another human being. So what are we supposed to do? You have to change your thoughts. Just like you change your thoughts about set, uh, singleness, you need to change your thoughts about the purpose of marriage and its role in your life. The implications are freeing and transforming. Secondly, stay there. Stay there. Now, don't go, don't, 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 I know, immediately, if he's abusive, if she's this, she did not, I'm not talking about that. The vast majority of the reasons why we separate have nothing to do with abuse, sexual or otherwise. The majority, the vast majority, is because of our selfishness. Jesus says that. The reason why he gave, Jesus said, the reason why Moses gave, allowed you to give a certificate of divorce was because you are sinful. So stay put. Husbands, love them. Wives, the text says, and I won't read, let me read the last verse. The last verse, however, verse 33, let each of you love your wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Amen. That word respect in the original language means to honor and give reverence to Let's pray. Lord, you are an amazing God. And you give amazing gifts. And just as you give the gift of singleness, you give to others of us the gift of marriage. This, this picture that speaks of a mystery God, take your word today and plant it in our hearts. May, we, may every person that is in here who is married experience every joy and every privilege and everything that you designed marriage to provide. May they experience it in, their, in its fullness. Thank you for giving us the spouse that you gave us. Thank you when it's tough. Thank you for the times of joy. Thank you for the passion. Thank you for giving each of us somebody to make us look more like you. Thank you for our spouses. Bless this church. I lift every marriage up in this place. May all of our marriages reflect the mystery that is the relationship between you and us. Glorify your name in every marriage today. In Christ's name I pray. And the church said, amen. Now let's, let's give the Lord a hand.